Just as enslaved peoples tend to be despised, so the work done by slaves tended to acquire social stigmas in countries around the world. In Java, for example, free people did not want to carry their own packages, since slaves carried packages, and therefore free people without slaves would hire a slave for such chores. Similarly, in Egypt, work done by slaves was spurned by working-class people, even after slavery was over. Sometimes it was not just particular kinds of work, but hard work in general, or work under the direction of a foreman or overseer that was stigmatized. Just as great conquerors like the Mongols or the Spaniards disdained commerce as beneath them, so ordinary people in slave societies disdained many kinds of work because it had been done by slaves. One consequence of this was that immigrants with a work ethic, such as Italian immigrants to Brazil and Argentina, who often entered such societies much poorer than the existing white populations of these countries, began at the bottom by working at many tasks that local whites disdained, and ultimately rose to a higher economic plane than the whites who had been born there. Whatever their initial disadvantages, the immigrants were not burdened with the native-born whites' aversions to work. Former slaves and the descendants of slaves likewise developed aversions to tasks performed under slavery. In the British West Indies, for example, blacks, after emancipation, left the plantations in such numbers that a whole new plantation workforce had to be imported from India to replace them. The economic costs of such attitudes, deriving from slavery and continuing for generations thereafter, cannot be quantified, but also cannot be dismissed as negligible. Where slaves and slave owners have been of visibly different races, then the racial animosities and distrust deriving from the era of slavery may also last for many generations after slavery itself is over, leading to economic and psychic costs to individuals as well as social costs to nations. Although the negative economic consequences of slavery, including consequences among generations born long after slavery itself was ended, cannot be quantified, the patterns of lasting economic lags in regions where slavery was widespread may nevertheless be suggestive. In the United States, and no doubt some other societies, one of the major psychological legacies of slavery has been a sense of shame and resentment among the black population and a sense of guilt among the white population. The reiterated depiction of enslavement as a peculiarly black experience falsely makes this seem to be a uniquely shameful fate to which a particular race submitted, requiring for some of their descendants compensatory bombast from themselves and, if possible, compensatory benefits to be extracted from others. To whites, the false depiction of the history of slavery makes some feel uniquely guilty and responsible for the current misfortunes of blacks. Such attitudes, and the many cross-currents they generate, are hardly the framework for a rational discussion or resolution of today's social issues. The physical and psychic sufferings of slaves in the past are neither necessary nor sufficient to explain the economic and other differences between their present-day descendants and members of the general population. The economic and other disparities between Europeans and Africans living, respectively, in Europe and Africa are vastly greater than the disparities between the descendants of Europeans and Africans living in the United States. The latter have not lost but gained economically from living in the United States. That these gains derive from the tragic fate of their ancestors does not make them any less gains, over and above where these descendants would be today if their ancestors had been left alone in peace in their homeland. This cannot morally justify the seizing of their ancestors. It simply affects the cause and effect question of the reasons for black-white disparities today. Often, the economic lags or social pathology of American blacks have been blamed on a legacy of slavery. Whether it is the dearth of marriages and families among contemporary blacks or their lower labor force participation than whites or their high crime rates, slavery has often been invoked as an explanation. Yet the fact is that in the late 19th century, when blacks were just one generation out of slavery, there was nothing like today's level of unwed births or failure to participate in the labor force. It has been from the 1960s onward that these social pathologies have escalated. Whatever the cause, it has risen long after slavery had ended. Two very different questions have been confused as regards the history of black families. One, 
why marriage rates differ between blacks and whites, and two, why marriage rates among blacks are much lower now than in the past. Official census data show that blacks had slightly higher marriage rates than whites for every census from 1890 to 1940, but far lower marriage rates than whites by 1960. On the black-white difference, some have argued that the census data from the late 19th and early 20th centuries are misleading, that black unmarried women with children in that era called themselves widows to avoid the embarrassment of being unwed mothers, even though the mortality rate among black men was not enough to account for so many widows. Interestingly enough, those who argued this way offered no explanation for the high rate of marriage among black men during that same era since unmarried fathers were unlikely to have children living with them to require them to pretend to be married when they were not. As of 1940, for example, from 66 to 70 percent of non-white males in age brackets from 30 and up reported themselves in the census as married and living with a spouse. Adding those black males who were widowers, separated or divorced, more than three-quarters of black males had been married despite being only the third generation after slavery. However one resolves the question of the black-white differences in rates of married and unwed motherhood, the more fundamental question as regards the legacy of slavery argument is why black marriage rates began a precipitous decline in 1960, nearly a century after the end of slavery. While the percentage of first births that were premarital has long differed as between blacks and whites, as it differed between antebellum white Southerners and white Northerners, and between other groups around the world in places where slavery cannot be invoked as an explanation. The sharp increase in premarital first births among blacks began in the 1960s. From 1930 to 1934, 31% of first births to black women were premarital, while from 1990 to 1994, 77% were. Moreover, whereas in 1930 to 1934, premarital births plus the births of children conceived before marriage but born after marriage were together still a minority in all black births. By 1994, these two categories constituted 86% of all black births. That such a legacy of slavery would take nearly a century to appear strains credulity.